My name is Jennifer Samuel. I'm a photo editor at National Geographic right now. Um, we've worked together a little bit. We haven't worked on an assignment just yet, um, but uh, been following each other's work for a while, so really happy to be here. Jennifer is my biggest champion. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so, yeah, and thank you to the museum um, and to the Center for Fine Art Photography for bringing us out here. Um, so why don't we just kind of go take a few steps back. Um, what made you want to be a photographer, and um, who are your biggest influences? Oh, dear. <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's going to be a little cheesy to say that growing up with National Geographic made me want to be a photographer, but that, but that has to be at least a little bit part of it. <laughs> we set it up. <laughs> yeah, right. We set up the whole exhibit, right. me being uh -huh. here, all for you to say that. Um, I mean, I, I think, right, so to some degree, like, the two are almost synonymous, but I, I very much, I'm um, growing up in a world of images, I'm... Uh, I think it was a really big part of it. And then also, I, my training is as a designer, uh, as an industrial designer and um, in graphic design. So I, a lot, I, for a while, I only wanted to work for nonprofits. And um, the thing that would always happen is they would say, oh, we don't have the budget for a photographer. <laughs> um, and so uh, not knowing any better at the time, I would go out and try to shoot my own photographs. Um, and that's when I started to fall, fall in love with the process. Uh, of it, for sure. And you mentioned Lynn Johnson, mm -hmm. who's incredible and wonderful. Oh, who, absolutely. Any others yeah. that kind of really caught your, like, currently or in the past that you really loved seeing their work and how they kind of built stories? I think, you know, in a lot of ways, it's um, it's really easy to talk about uh, colleagues at Nat Geo mm -hmm. um, because they do all work in the same line. But I'll definitely say absolutely, um, like Robin Hammond, for example, um, who's photograph of um, the the young lady in pink on the cover of not just a, a gender issue was a really stunning and just floored me when I saw it. But also, even commercial photographers, um, Eric Almas, um, uh, maybe some of you know, is uh, is famous. Um, even though his work is a lot of composites and all kinds of you know crazy production, but at the, he in, at the in the essence of it, when I look at his photographs, I see like a lot of mystery, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of beautiful light and fog and a lot of mythology and that's I think to some degree like the um, the world the imaginary world that the part that, that doesn't get told you know is, is it's creating that world yeah that's right that's right Can this is a surprise mics? yep yeah. oh yeah sorry mm -hmm. um, and so why don't you tell us a little bit more about your research process and how you find stories how you uh, figure out how to create like how you come up with a visual approach that you're because um, you're obviously very conscientious about um, telling stories in a complex way so how do you how does that work for you well Jen I think actually also everyone here wants to know how you research stories <laughs> also how does Nat Geo come up with stories how do you still come up with stories um, and you know before before coming to photographers you know how does that happen I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, I think sometimes, I think we really rely on our journalists in the field, right? Like we're in the office and we have a lot of photographers and writers that we work with. And I think when we're looking for, like right now, the current issue is the women's issue. So, which is, you know, our first issue, uh, kind of written, photographed entirely by women. And we sent out like mass emails and we're like, what are you guys thinking? What do you feel like is important? What are the stories? And I think, the hard thing with, with a National Geographic story is that it can be quite broad, right? Some people think too small almost. It's not like we want the tiniest, like there's so much power in these very specific stories, but I think, you know, visually, and we, we want to tell big stories, at least, you know, for features in the magazine. So I think we really do rely on, um, you know, our photographers out in the field and their subject areas of, of expertise. Um, and then I think there's always a lot of back and forth because I think there are a lot of great concepts and a lot of great ideas that would make a fabulous New Yorker story and visually it doesn't offer a whole lot of opportunity to, to carry 30 pages of interesting, varied photography, right? Um, so I think um, there's some stories that were like, what's your shot list? What are, we, what, what are your ideas and how is this not 
the same photograph over and over. <laughs> and if that's the answer, then it might not be the best story for us, right? Or maybe it's a great text story, but there's not, or maybe it's illustrations or something like that, right? Um, so I think it's a lot of back and forth with photographers. Um, and it's hard. I mean, I think there's there's so many great ideas and, and figuring it out from kind of the idea to execution is just like never a straight line. It's kind of this very chaotic, messy line that while you're juggling eight stories and the photographer is juggling eight stories and you somehow it works, but it's not always. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like the, I feel like it's also like the magic of the photographic process as well, which is that mm -hmm. there's the things that you plan and you do your research and you do as much as you can um, to know as much as you can about each situation. And then you kind of make sure that you put yourself in the position for wonderful moments to happen so that the things that you can't plan happen, right? And you're ready for them. Yeah, that's right. What about you? Well, I mean, you know, I like to research the first part of it, go there, and then throw the, away, throw the rest away. <laughs> um, I, I will say that I, I think uh, um, that trap that you fall into when you're trying to research a story, um, like from a, the way that a writer would research a story, is the same trap that I fall into, absolutely. I get excited about themes and ideas, and then when it comes time, I'm like, oh, actually, um, it's like trying to photograph um, a senator speaking, right? That's like not, um, it's very difficult to make that interesting. Um, so um, a lot, I think it, I'm always listening and uh, thinking about new ideas for stories constantly, all the time. And especially when I'm out on assignment, actually I'm paying attention to what other people are saying to me. If something catches my interest, like, oh, um, this particular thing is happening that, that this particular time, and um, if in any way that relates to one of the bigger themes I'm thinking about, I'm like, ah, aha, I will file that away in my mental notebook, which unfortunately has a lot of holes in it. <laughs> so things do leak out, but if, it, but if it appears, if I encounter it more than once, then I know, okay, not only do I now remember this thing that I forgot, but it's probably important because I've encountered it, you know, it's important enough that it has occurred to me more than one time. But I do tend to uh, do a combination of the aerial view, thinking about themes like um, you know indigenous conservation, which is very big and very broad and very sort of like abstract, mm -hmm. and then combining that with the um, on the ground research, which is thinking like oh, um, you know, I, my friend this uh, Sammy Herder is doing uh, tourism and he wants me to come take some photographs for him. You know, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Actually, those two things connect somewhere in the middle. Um, he is, um, he and his family are, are bringing tourism to Lake Inari in, in northern Finland. And, and this is a way to help conserve the boreal forest up there and keep their way of life alive, right? So, so that's that connection in between. So I'm always thinking about all these little bits and, and hopefully tr the main thing is trying to link them together. What, what, it's a fancy word that was used a while ago is uh, cross-pollination. And that's, that's, that's what it is, cross-pollination of ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I would just add that I think sometimes, you know, for example, like the issue that's coming out for November, um, you know, sometimes these story, these themes are so huge, right? Like, how do you do a series of stories on women, 50% of the world, right? And <laughs> you, you're not going to get everything, you know? There's important things that you want to get and um, be thorough in, but you know that the intention is not to cover everything, right? So, um, again, like you said, like trying to figure out these threads and these kinds of themes that are happening in different places. and. And also, you know, different audiences, what we're feeling in the United States mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as a groundswell or, you know, a movement or something like that. What is, what is that looking like in India? What is that looking like in other places? And can you fairly draw comparisons or what, what um, is in your head makes sense and what in actuality is true, right? Yeah. 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 That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's not, it's never, there's not a perfect way to do it, right? And when it comes down to like editing an issue and then also within the story, there's not, there's like many right ways to, to figure out how to, how to tell those stories, right? It comes down to a lot of choices um, in the final edits and stuff like that. Um, so a lot of your work is about identity. Right. Mm, right. Uh -huh. um, and so I'm just interested in this idea of, it seems like for you, you've, learned how to hunt and make traditional canoe, uh, kayaks, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> um, 
And it's very much like this kind of cyclical thing, like the stories you've done have been about you kind of connecting back to your Nanai heritage, but then in that it's also kind of changed your identity and, and who you are, right? Yeah, that's right, definitely. Yeah, I am, you know, the cool thing about, I think, photography and maybe even just in general assignments is that it forces you to go and get more deeply involved with it. It would be very easy to chicken out on in general. Like, there are many people that I have met that I would definitely never have met. I am not a photographer. And I bet a lot of you out here, like, know that. I can see a lot of shaking, like, heads nodding, so that's good. Yeah, it, it makes us... Um, bolder and step outside of ourselves. You're not just thinking uh, about what everyone else is thinking about us. All right? So there's that bit of it, which I think is valuable. Um, and so uh, in terms of identity, uh, certainly in a lot of ways, like uh, almost every story that I do is in some way connected to that central thread of identity. Like um, for me, it's been like an, a lifelong search for finding my ancestral homeland, my ancestral community, which was, to some degree, it's not like it was taken away, uh, but it feels to me like that. You know, it feels to me like, oh, here I am, um, the son of immigrants, and, um, like, I fit in very well. Like, obviously, you know, um, I don't have a whole lot of, a uh, whole lot of accent. So you, I, I'm very fluid in a lot of different situations, but at the same time too, um, while America is my home, I'm not completely at home here in the same way that when I'm, uh, in uh, the Nibak community, I'm also very much at home, but not totally at home. And that is sort of the curse of being what they, I think they call like a third culture kid, right? I don't know, I love this term, third culture kid. But it's just the notion that you fit in, um, you learn to fit in everywhere and you're, you fit in nowhere at the same time. And so, and for me, photography is a way to be able to um, get, closer to that sort of beating heart of humanity, which I can connect to, you know, uh, that I, I feel closer to people and closer to all these different places by being a photographer. And asking yeah. questions and being able to yeah. ask the questions that might not, you might not be able to ask as a, as just if you were hanging out, right? To ask the kinds of questions yeah. and, and probe and stick around and yeah. I, it's a, I also, I, w I wish that it was, uh, Jen makes it sound like uh, <laughs> this is easier than it really is. No, a lot of times there's no, they, for me, there's not so much the, uh, some people are good at this, but I am not so big on uh, asking of questions. What I do instead is I spend 10 times as much time <laughs> to sit around and watch and, and I try to find the answers to my questions by just becoming a part of the community or just disappearing into it and trying to figure out um, my the, I mean, even the questions themselves, I don't necessarily know until I spend enough time mm -hmm. in a place uh, yeah, doing that thing. Yeah. 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 Um, anything else you want to talk about? On identity? Oh, no. yeah, sure. No, 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 no. I'm just yeah. asking. Oh, I have oh, other no. questions. Okay. No, no. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned this a bit in your in your talk, but you know, coverage of indigenous communities is kind of notoriously uh, kind of rested on stereotypes where people are often pictured as kind of relics of the past and you know, exclusively in traditional de dress. Um, so can you just talk a little bit more about why these visual stereotypes are dangerous and how you go about mm. kind of, on the one hand, photographing traditional communities, but trying to counter some of those narratives? And, and yeah, I think there's just so much in our, in our knowledge of our own countries that, that we don't, we're not exposed to until we go searching for it, right? Well, I, this is, I, I'm going to turn this question back on you also mm -hmm. because this is a very good question for a, a photo editor, mm -hmm. actually. Um, since in, in some ways you, are, you have a, a hand on the levers <laughs> of the, the photographic industry, the visual industry, the storytelling, the journalistic industry, which is, what about those stereotypes? Yeah. Why is it, why is it what it is? Well, I mean, I think that's, that's part of what we're here talking about, right, is that, that uh, I think for a long time, not only in media, but in fine art, 
uh, I think broadly as a culture, we're having a lot of conversations about race and representation and gender and diversity and who gets to tell stories in mainstream institutions and and about whom and and uh, you know are, is our perspective on these things accurate if they're they've been told through one lens for a hundred years? Are we getting accurate pictures of the world around us? Right. Um, so I think it gets back to that. Um, but I think I think it's 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 cyclical because I think you know a photographer can bring back you know especially now in you know shooting digital thousands of pictures um, and it really comes down to to how much is an editor or an outlet looking for a certain kind of narrative and are those the pictures that you you pick are you looking for a complicated narrative and uh, and how do you sim sig signal these things right like there are things that you can do in text that you can't do in photography. There are things in photography that you can't do in text, right? So how do you make all of those kind of work together to try and complicate the narrative and, and tell stories? And, and part of that is having more indigenous people on your team, right? To, to um, and, and um, to help tell their own stories accurately, right? Yeah, um, yeah, right. And so I think that's something that, that not only in the media industry, but just as a society, I think that's something that's a conversation that's that's happening constantly, um, and there's a lot of room for improvement. Right? <laughs> we are definitely not there yet. So, but I mean, as as a photographer, in terms of like, I mean, you must be having those conversations with editors constantly, yes. right? Because it's a lot of education. Um, like you're educating yourself about each new area that you work in, um, and then you are also kind of having to counter an editor that's like, well, I think the story's about this, and you're like, actually, the story's not really about that, right? Or this is not, right? So talk to me about that process. Well, I will have to say I'm very thankful to have had uh, actually a very good editor <laughs> um, it, um, who have been uh, doing a great thing. But I will say, uh, first of all, to start with, the question, like the, the question of stereotypes, like stereotypes has become a bit of a loaded word, but 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 um, remember, I talk about with other photographers the idea of stereotypes all the time, because think about this, I, when Chris Burkhardt first started doing his like person staring at landscapes in the distance thing, that was brand new and it was so cool, right? <laughs> you know, like or tiny tent. Uh, tunnel tent lit up with a headlamp at the base of the, the you know the Himalayas epic beautiful shot now that we have seen it in, iterated one million times on Instagram every hour it's now a stereotype right and so stereotypes aren't just about people but they are about just something that we you know it's like we, we already know we already know how that goes what that story is and we don't need to tell it again necessarily like it's fine you know it, it, chris burkhard telling that story and continuing to tell a story i am fully on board with you know i am but i think this is where the the danger lies is that if you f google any single idea and look and you know click on it the google image search and what comes up um, for actually a really good one is type in native american and click on image search and you will see a bunch of people usually a middle-aged native american man usually a plains person wearing a plains headdress and you, you know if you manage to get to the second page which no one does right because it's school but um, you get to the second page you might see some worse ones which is then the same man but riding on the horseback with a bow in his hand right which is really not uh, what Lakota or Dakota or Indian Plains people really look like um, today and so the the point of it being like that not that that is not a perspective to have like yeah you I, I, you could make the argument that um, the the Plains Indian on horseback hunting buffalo with bow and arrow is a is an image that should exist, right? Because it does tell you a little bit about history, about a moment in time, and all this kind of stuff. But the problem is, is that everything anyone knows about uh, Indians, and not just like uh, you know, like Native Americans, including Native Alaskans, Native Siberians, everybody is that they are all riding on horseback hunting buffalo somehow 
in the Arctic and in the tropics with bows and arrows, right? So it's not, that's the, the problem is we need many perspectives. I always talking about with that diversity of cultures and all that kind of stuff. It's all about having many points of view so that we get like a, a much more rounded and interesting point of view. And of course, the trick is also to not have all those different points of view be just a bunch of noise and a bunch of garbage also, but that they're stunningly well crafted, uh, like different points of view, like all the ones, you know, well, the ones in this room for, for you know, as a, an example. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about like the editor and photographer relationship in terms of how it's worked? Sure. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, so I will say that I I do romanticize the editor photographer relationship because uh, because I think the time went by when there was this moment this moment uh, when editors and photographers worked together like uh, in news media and journalism uh, really closely and there was the and it still happens some places National Geographic being one of them where there's the the, the edit posted up on the wall and people fight for their for their favorite images etc. But um, it, to a large degree, many outlets nowadays don't have that anymore. It doesn't exist, you know. And um, now with digital, with more and more stories coming out all the time, it's vanished to a certain degree. And I, I'm sad about that because um, I want that. Like I want to grow. I want to learn. And my editors are better and smarter <laughs> than I am. Um, there are certain things that I know I can do. Um, but my editors have seen everything. Like they've seen my photograph iterated better. It has been done better than, than I, I have made it, right? And, and Jenna's seen it already before. So when I talk, when I get a chance to talk to her about it, she will, she will call me out on it and say, oh yeah, this is great, but actually I don't want to put words in your mouth for you. I'm like, have we had a couple? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm making it up. So my, my hypothetical editor here might say like, <laughs> this is editor. a great shot, but um, can you go do it again just uh, without this person in the corner or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. And I appreciate that. I really like that. So when I do get a chance to work with it, uh, an editor that has a little time, I will say, hey, can I call you on the phone? Let's chat for an hour. And so we do. We sit in front of Lightroom at our respective computers and talk about it. And it's like, best hour. I love it. Right. Um, so if I can get it, I will always try to do it. Um, and how, so how does it look from your point of view? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the photographer. Um, I think, you know, for me, I've worked with a lot of newer photographers to National Geographic, and then I'm quite hands-on because no matter how ready somebody is, they get quite intimidated when they're like, oh my god, it's my first National Geographic assignment. Oh my god, I can't, I can't mess it up. I can't. Uh, and they kind of psych themselves out, right? So I think for me, it's about like being very hands-on, making sure they know where they're going, what we're trying to get out of every shoot we do, um, and you know, going through the edit at some point and, and just seeing, you know, are you shooting from the same distance all the time? Are there these kind of habits that you kind of have that you don't realize you have? Okay, have you tried this? Have you tried this? Um, if there's a particular shot, um, we um, you know that, that we really need for the story that's not that visual. Like, how can we work it, and how can we just like pushing them to kind of try different things that might be outside of their comfort zone because we need a certain kind of image, which is not an easy image to make. Um, and then I think you know there are stories that I'll work with photographers where they know a lot more than I do about the subject. This is their tenth story for National Geographic. They know our process, they know the drill, they've worked with writers before, they've done, and then it kind of, it, it varies. I think each photographer is, is quite different in terms of how, and at different parts of the process, you know, what they, what they need and what they need help with, um, uh, and what they don't need help with, right? Um, so I think it really, it really varies, and I think um, it's always very hard once you have you know, several weeks of work and you're trying to get it down to what are the essentials or how do you start the story, how do you, you know, what's the middle of the story, what's the end of the story, and how do you take people through? I think something that, you know, I mean, I'm curious for you in terms of, of working in different mediums. Like, I mean, I think there's the print layout, which is always very exciting, and then digital, of course, and then, you know, Instagram stories and storytelling on these different platforms that all hit different audiences, right? You know, the people that are subscribing to our print magazine are not necessarily the people that are gonna follow an Instagram story, right? Um, so there's opportunity. Obviously, you can't go into the depth of a 4,000 word essay in print on Instagram, it's not gonna happen, but at least it's still, 
there's different opportunities in that. Is that kind of what have you? I mean, I know you've been working in a lot of mediums. Mm -hmm. Are there different things that you've been exploring or seeing that are exciting to you? Um, well, I, I, the uh, digital stories still are not as exciting to me as print stories for sure. But, but. Uh, there are some cool things. One of the things that I love is the existence of the, like when you scroll down the page and there is an animated still photograph, essentially. It's not really like, it's not like an animated GIF and it's not a cinemagraph per se, but it's just a, a shot that's held still, like a still photograph would be, except that something moves in it. And um, you know, if it's seamlessly integrated, that's really cool and always draws my eye. Um, and I think can be a great way to take something that would normally be very static and kind of dead and give it just a little bit of life, you know, to kind of surprise you. So I think that's terrific. And I, and I love different ways uh, that has, have happened digitally where words and pictures get a chance to mesh together differently. Um, so uh, like, um, it's one thing about Instagram stories that's cool is that you, I mean, it's not as pretty, but you have photographs that have text overlaid on top of them and they interact in a different way, right? You have uh, emoticons like, you know, posted in different places and they signal, they talk to you differently. I am a really big believer in um, the fact that photographs and words go together in this amazing way that really nothing else does. Um, on, you know, on video, which is like the dominant medium film, and media, uh, film is like the dominant uh, medium right now. It's like kind of the, the fine art, the art form of our time. Uh, and it is really powerful. But there's still something that can't, that it can't do, which is when it comes to still photograph and, and written words, um, especially with a skillful writer, man, those skill, those writers can just get to these abstract concepts and these ideas that you couldn't possibly do in video with a voiceover or however. So that's really cool. I think that's amazing. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I, I have a question because I, I want to learn how to look better. So, um, and I hope you'll both answer this question, but I'll just give you an example. Like that one right there, had I not, I learned so much about what the photographer was capturing in terms of those layers. Oh, the Sam Abel photograph? This one yeah. right here. Uh -huh. um, but what I notice as I walk around is some seem to stun me just visually, and some stun me because of what got captured as a story. And so I'm curious, as for both of you, when you were taking photos, when you were assessing photos for your magazine, um, what are you wanting it to, what boxes do you want it to check? And I'm guessing it sometimes changes, and I'm curious about those choices for you. I mean, I think, you know, the most important thing is, is an emotional response, right? Um, I, well, I guess I would say there's two things. I think there's like storytelling in a frame, and then like an image that just really kind of, you connect with that person as a human, right? And even if the frame isn't perfect, it's such a strong kind of, you see the person and you really relate to them.